Today we're going to do some old school hacking. In 1996, a seminal paper was published to the hacking e-zine FRAC titled Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit. This was the first public step-by-step -step guide on how to exploit a stack buffer overflow. Whilst computer security has moved on a lot since then, this technique still underpins a lot of more advanced exploitation techniques. So we're going to step through one today and see what we can learn. So here I've got an Ubuntu 20 box all set up, and I've got a little test program. I'll execute anything once, so let's run it and see what happens. Okay, so it's asking us to put in a name, so if I put in my name, I get a friendly little greeting. If we actually look at the source code for this, it is one of my finer C programs. It does a quick check that we've got the number of arguments expected, and then it calls a function called print name. And print name takes a copy of the supply string into a local buffer and then prints it out. This might seem a little bit contrived, but it is quite indicative of a C program you might actually write. You get some data, you copy it locally, and then you do some processing on it. Thing is though, we're not restricted to just putting in names. We can put in any characters we want in that. So I could put in some A's and it'll say hello AAA. And I could put in some more A's and it'll say that. And I could put in even more A's and then I could put in even more A's. Oh, and it crashed. So this is quite interesting. We've gotten to a point where we put in so many A's, it's caused the program to crash. So a segmentation fault is an access violation. We've tried to access memory. We've tried to access some invalid memory. So we've got a crash. So let's have a look under the hood to see what's going on. To do this, we'll use the GDB debugger. This is a command line debugger that is incredibly powerful. It allows you to inspect memory, view registers, set breakpoints, etc. It does have quite a steep learning curve though. To make things a bit easier, I use a plugin called Jeff or GDB Enhanced Features. What it does is it brings a lot of the information to the forefront, which prevents you from having to constantly type in arcane commands to see it. Now, before we get started, let's have a quick look at what we're actually working with. So we've got a 32-bit application. The reason I went for 32-bit application is that it just makes things slightly simpler and the original paper was based on 32-bit. Everything I talk about today is equally as applicable in 64-bit. So let's run GDB with our application. We can see here that GDB doesn't really give you a lot of information when you first uh, load it up, but we can see that we're running the Jeff plugin, which is good. So let's just set a breakpoint on main, our entry function, and uh, run it and see what happens. So there's a lot of information here, which Jeff has brought all to the forefront for us to see. So we can see all of our registers. We can see our stack. We can see the code, the instructions that we're actually executing. And we can also see the actual line in the source code that we're executing. If you were just using vanilla GDB, none of this information would be displayed for you, but you can get it all through commands. So, for instance, info registers will display all your registers, and disass, uh, and disass main will disassemble a function and show you the instructions inside it. Okay, so let's exercise our crash and see what we can learn through GDB. We know that it was triggered by putting in a really long string as the argument. So you could just keep typing AAA or some really long string, but that's a bit tedious. If you do dollar paren, then anything inside the parens, GDB will interpret and evaluate as a bash script. So what we can do here is actually use callouts to Python and say, I'm going to give you a string, please execute it, and then we're going to import sys, sys.studout.buffer.write, and then inside that we're going to say, please print out a times 200. So what we're doing here is we're asking Python to generate us a string, which is 200 A's, and then that will get evaluated into the uh, into the argument. So when we run it, it will be the equivalent of doing R and then typing out 200 A's. So this is just a bit less typing, but we'll actually use this to help build up um, build up interesting inputs later on. The reason I use sys.outbuffer write rather than print is because in Python 3, print assumes the text is UTF-8 encoded, but we don't want any encoding. We just want to output raw hex characters. So we run this go past our breakpoint, and we've crashed. So we can see here that we crashed with a save fault, which is what we saw when we were running it, when we were running it outside of GDB. But let's have a look at the registers. So as an aside, your processor has registers, which are small, fast chunks of memory, which your program can load data into and then manipulate. Most of these are general purpose, so your program can use them however they want, but there are a few which are special purpose and have very specific roles. And one of those is EIP, or the instruction pointer. This is how your program knows what to execute. The EIP register always stores the address of the instruction that you want to fetch and then execute. So in fact, as an aside, we can kind of see that. If we just run the program normally, and then as I step through the program, 
we can see that EIP gets updated after each instruction. So if I step through the program, we can see that EIP after each instruction uh, gets updated because it's going to load, it's going to point to the next instruction to load and execute. So if we go back to our crash, so what we've done here is we've somehow managed to set our instruction pointer to the address OX4141414141, which is ASCII encoding for AAAA, and Jeff has kindly uh, filled in this information for us so we can see. So somehow we've put in more data than our computer is expecting, and we've managed to set our instruction pointer to be that uh, to be a subset of that data. So this is quite interesting, and this is why it crashes, because OX4141414141 is not a valid address that doesn't exist in our program, so that's why you get uh, an access violation. But it does mean that we've somehow managed to gain control of the program, even if we just caused it to crash. We've somehow managed to set the instruction pointer to some part of the data that we've put in. So to understand why this has happened, we need to take a step back. How do functions actually work under the hood? So you have a function, which is a blob of code, and you call it, which means you jump to that. So you set the instruction pointer to wherever that blob of code is, and then you do function things. And at the end of it, you need to return. But how do you know where to return to? So, so let's put a breakpoint in main at the point where we want to call our. So let's put a breakpoint in main at the point where we want to call our print name function, right? So we can see here that we've stopped on the call instruction. So call means set EIP to the address of the function, and then when we step into it. We're now, we've now jumped here and we're now executing it. What that call function has actually done is it's pushed to the stack a return address, i.e. the instruction that you want to execute after your function's finished. So the stack is a region of memory in your program which is like scratch space. So when you call a function, it will grow the stack and in there it will store all of its local variables and any space it needs for calculations. Then at the end of the function, it shrinks that back down. So at the start and the end of a function, your stack should always look the same. It will just grow and shrink as it needs. So when you call a function, the first thing it does is pushes the return address, i.e. where you should return to after the function is done, to the stack. So when the function gets to the end, it knows that the top of the stack is where it needs to return to. And we can see this. If I uh, look at and we can see this. So if I set a breakpoint on the end of our print name function and I run through to it, then we can see here that we've broken on ret. So ret is the instruction which says, I'm done with the function, please return back to where I came from. And we can see at the top of the stack is an address, ox565562ec. Um, and this is one of the nice things about Jeff, it fills in all this contextual information for you. This says here, oh, that's in main, it's, and it's this uh, instruction, add esp ox10. So if I Execute. If so if I step over ret, then we can see here that we've jumped back to this instruction that was on the stack. So to summarize, when you call a function, it will push the way you need to return to after that function onto the stack. The function will then grow the stack as it needs, shrink it at the end, take that address off the top of the stack, stick it in EIP, and then return to it. So that's that's kind of how functions work under the hood. Let's have a look at the source code for print name. We allocate a buffer of 100 characters. We copy our string into that buffer, we then print it, and then we will return, we'll call ret. The thing is, computers will pretty much do what you tell them to do, and you've told it to copy your string into that buffer. Now, the issue here is that your buffer is only 100 characters, right? So you've called your function, you've pushed the return address to the stack, you've then grown the stack by 100 characters, and then you're going to copy in your string. So N, So if I put in my name, it would copy N-A-T-H-A-N, -A -A or if I put in 100 A's, it would go A-A-A-A-A-A. But we haven't given it 100 A's, we've given it 200 A's. And the computer doesn't know any different. You've just told it to copy 200 A's into this buffer. So it's gone return address, 100 character buffer, a a a a and it's just going to and it's just going to overwrite everything in its path. It's going to stamp on all that memory and just put in A's all the way down. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to overwrite that return address. So rather than it being OX55, whatever it was that we want to return to main, it's going to be full of A's, which is OX414141. So we can again, we can see this. So let's have a quick look at the print name function. We'll set a breakpoint on the return function. Oh, sorry, on the return instruction. So we're going to say, do all the function and then just stop before you return. All right, and then we'll run it with our 200 A's. So we can see here that we're stopped on ret. What ret does is it takes the address from the top of the stack and sticks it in EIP. But the top of the stack now is just full of A's. So it's just going to take those A's and stick it in EIP. 
which we can see here. Next instruction, the IP is now AAA. We have, so this is the classic buffer overflow, right? We had a buffer, but an unbounded write into it. So we just went, hey, we so we just went right, 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 hey, 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 and just absolutely and just stamped over everything in its path, which includes the return address. So this now means we can set EIP to anything we want, which is pretty cool. Um, at the moment, just setting it to a isn't that useful because, like we uh, discussed earlier, OX forty one forty one forty one forty one isn't a valid memory address. But let's just take this one step further and just see if we can fully control what goes in EIP. But let's put another address in there, one that we fully specified. So we know that if we keep writing from the top of our buffer, eventually we will overwrite that return address. Now, exactly where that is in relation to the start, we need to work out. So there's a couple of ways of doing this. We can do it heuristically. So let's just say I want to do, I know the buffer is going to be 100. So let's put in 100 and then I'm going to write another string after it. So we'll fill up 100 and then we'll write ABCD afterwards. So if we do this and continue, so it doesn't crash. So we're not quite there yet. Okay, so let's try 110. Okay, so we did crash, but we had CD and then some junk in the IP. So that means we're probably two off. So let's try 112. Okay, so we've got ABCD in EIP. So this means that there's 112 bytes of padding, and then whatever comes, then the four bytes following that will go into EIP. So you imagine you've got your buffer, then 112 bytes from the start of that buffer is where your return address will be. So that's cool. We can we can stamp that. We can stamp an ABCD. As an aside, you'll notice that EIP is actually OX 44, 43, 42, 41. That's because this is a little Indian machine, so bytes are interpreted from right, so numbers are interpreted from right to left rather than left to right. But again, Jeff kind of handles this for you, and it's just something to be, and it's just something to be aware of. So that's one way you can do it heuristically. Um, another way to do it is empirically. So if I actually have a look at how print name works. We can see here that it actually grows the stack by OX 70 bytes. So when you call the function, it'll push the return address. The function will start and it says, I, I, need, I know I need a OX 70 bytes of uh, scratch space. So it will grow the stack by that much. And then at the end, it will reduce it. So, we, and so OX 70 is 112 in decimal. So you could just look at the disassembly and work that out. And if you don't want to do either of those ways, Jeff actually provides you a tool for automating this. So if you do pattern create and then a number like 200, it will generate you a 200 character long string, but this string is special because every four byte substring only appears once. So what we do is we take that and then we run the program with that and wait for it to crash, uh, and which, which it will do because we know 200 characters is enough to crash the program. Um, and then what you do is you do pattern search and then you put in the four character substring that ended up in your EIP, so DAAB, uh, DAAB, uh, and then it will tell you that that is 112 bytes offset from the beginning. So you've got you've got choices how you do it. But we know that if we fill if we overwrite our buffer with 112 characters, then with the following four will go into EIP. So what this means now is that whatever we replace ABCD with will end up in EIP. So effectively, whatever address we put in there, we can jump to. So we can force our program to jump to anywhere we want. But where do we want to jump to? So we've got this buffer. And we can write almost as much data as we want into it, so why not jump into that? So there's no reason why we can't keep writing after that return address. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to fill it with some data. Um, I'm going to fill it with 100 OX90 bytes. Um, why I've done that will make sense in a minute. If we run this now, we can see that on our stack we've got our controlled address, which is still ABCD, um, and then a whole load of OX90s. So using GDB, we can get the address of our buffer that we're copying into, right? So this is the start of the address where we then write 112 bytes and then the return address and then those OX90s. And we can see here that it is OXFFFFCFCC. So, what I'm gonna, so that's the start of our buffer. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to make our return address point to some number of bytes, like 150 over um, from the start of that buffer. So that means we'll skip the padding, we'll skip the return address, and we'll land somewhere in all those OX90s. So... What I will do is then replace the ABCD with, uh, o with OX62, D0, FF, FF. So this might look a little bit strange, but these are just raw bytes. Um, and they are FF, FF, D0, 62, which is the address of the buffer plus 150. So it means we'll, we, we, so it's the address of 150 past the start of that buffer. So if we run that, we can see here that the top of the 
the top of the stack is now fffd062, which is what we put into those four bytes. Um, so if we now execute the ret, it will pop that off and stick that into EIP. And now we're executing all these knobs. So what we've done is we've jumped into our buffer and it's now treating our buffer as code. And what I put in that buffer was ox90, ox90, ox90. So, so it will treat those bytes as x86 instructions. OX90 is a special x86 instruction called a NOP, which means no operation, i.e. don't do anything. It's a harmless instruction with no side effect. So we'll just keep going NOP onto the next one, onto the next one, onto the next one, and it'll keep going until it falls off the bottom and finds some other code. This is affectionately known as a NOP sled because you basically slide down all these NOPs until you hit something else. So if I just hit continue, we'll probably crash, which we have because there's nothing, we haven't put anything after those NOPs yet. So we'll just hit uninitialized memory, which will try and decode instructions and crash because they probably won't be valid instructions. In fact, we got sig ill, which means illegal instruction, i.e. I, it's tried to interpret something as an x86 instruction, which isn't a valid instruction. So we can jump into our buffer and then we can sort of slide down this NOP sled. But what do we put at the end of it? What do we want to execute? So what do we put after the NOP sled? Well, I know everyone has their own personal favourite series of 23 ASCII characters, and this is mine. So those 23 bytes are valid x86 instructions, which do something very specific, and we can see what they're doing here. So they zero out to the EAX register, they push that zero onto the stack, they then push two large random, random looking numbers onto the stack, but we can see here that they actually are the ASCII representation of bit slash bin slash sh. It then, it then loads that address into EBX. It then puts zero in ECX and puts zero in EDX. It then moves the number OXB into EAX. It will then exclude int OX80. Int OX80 means form a syscall, which basically means ask the kernel to execute something on your behalf. So if we look up the syscall table and look at OXB, we can see that it is execve. So what this is basically, so what this is telling the computer to do is execute slash bin slash sure, i.e. run a terminal. So, so we see here that GB is now told us we're actually executing a new program. So our original program doesn't exist anymore. So I can't, this has many doesn't exist because we're now executing something else. So to put all this into context, let's see what actually happens if we do it outside of GDB. So again, we're going to run our program a.out and we've got here the Python string that generates our payload and it crashed. So the reason we have this NOP sled is because stack addresses can vary slightly when you're running a program under GDB compared to when you're running it outside GDB. So all this means, so all we have to do is just increase this NOP sled by a large amount, which means we'll definitely land within it. And there we go. We print out this garbage, but we actually have an intractable command prompt. So what we've done here is we've exploited that original program to launch another program, which allows us to then take full control over it. So anything, any permissions that that original program had, I now have and I can do whatever I want with. So to take a step back and summarise what we've done, we had a program which had a bug which allowed you to write beyond the buffer. We then crafted a pay payload which exploited that overwrite to allow us to change where the program would jump to at the end of the function. We then caused it to jump into our own buffer where we had some shell code and that shell code executed a command terminal which means from a program that just took in a name and printed it out, we have exploited it to start up a whole new program and give us full control. So I think this is really cool. This kind of shows how you can take a program with what looks like a, cra a bug that just crashes and, uh, and exploit that to do something totally different. So linking back to what I said at the beginning in that computer security has come a long way since this, since this paper was first published, there are a lot of protections in place by default which prevent you from doing this kind of thing. So, and one of the main ones of those is stack protection. So there's no neat, so there's no real reason a stack should ever be executable. There's no reason you should be able to jump into a stack and start executing it. It really should just be for reading and writing data. So by default, all compilers now will emit code with a stack execution disabled. So I had to re-enable an executable stack in order to make this work. And another countermeasure that is on by default is something called ASLR or address space layout randomization. So we knew we used GDB to find out where our buffer was, and then we added a bit, and obviously we had a, we had a NOP sled to give us a bit of give, but we, we knew pretty much where that buffer was gonna be, which allowed us to set the return, uh, which allowed us to set the address that we wanted to jump to. 
Um, most operating systems now have something called ASLR, which what that does is every time it runs the program, it shifts the starting address. So it basically means every time, you, every time you run it, your buffer will be in a different location. So it's much harder to craft a payload with a return address because every time you run it, it'll be different. So that was a whirlwind tour of stack buffer overflows. I hope you found this interesting. I find this kind of thing fascinating. If you want to see me take another deep dive into something low level, then check out this next video.